Stores for Lucky and I do run the Pike County Historical Society and the Collins Museum, which is the official historical society of Pike County. And, um, you know, I think most people take history way too seriously these days, especially with, um, you know, all the social media influence and uh, people trying to right the wrongs of the past. Um, I never knew getting into this job 23 years ago when I came here on a three month contract. Um, and I ended up staying here as long as I have been. That there are so many people that have so much to say, and there's so many hurdles to overcome, and stories that you won't believe that have been concocted over the years that, you know, try and make the artifacts that you have in the museum, which stand alone, you know, on their own, uh, more interesting than they are. So we're going to cover some of that, some serious, some not so serious. And um, Mr. What's your name? The guy who contacted me to do this is that Jim Wilson. Hi, Jim. Nice no to meet you. For that. Never Mr. Wilson. Okay, I'm sorry, Mr. Wilson, but um, you asked me to talk a little bit about the Tom Quick Monument. I believe that was part of your request, so I'm throwing that in as a bonus. Woo. Okay, so you guys are from Massachusetts for the most part. No. No. Oh, I don't know. Because I lived in Massachusetts. New England. Now. New England. How many New Englanders? New England. Uh, <laughs> all right. Anybody from Lynn, Massachusetts? Lynn, Lynn City of San? Yeah. Okay, I lived there. I lived there for before I came here. This is where I got the call to come here. I got a letter in the mail. I worked briefly at the uh, museum there, and also for the House of Seven Gables. And a place, if anybody knows this, if you remember, it's like 25 years ago, a place in Swampscott called Papa John's. Anybody yeah. remember that place? It was like a little tiny Italian restaurant. Yeah. Did you know they had a big rat problem? I'm just saying. I don't need to ruin anything for anybody. <laughs> Got the letter, moved here. Papa <laughs> John was the biggest rat of them all, right? Anyway, um, okay, artifact or art fiction? The perils of a small town museum. And there are many, believe me, especially in Oakland. So, I'm supposed to press this button. This is the beautiful Collins Museum, uh, built in 1904. This is where the Museum and Historical Society is housed, right on 608 Broad Street in Milford. Um It was built in 1904 for a man by the name of Dennis McLaughlin. He was from a great place called Hoboken. He was from a great place called Hoboken, uh, New Jersey. And he grew up, came over as a young Irish boy, and worked his way up selling newspapers in the Horseshoe District to eventually buy one bar, and then another, and then another. And before you know it, he was a politician. <laughs> see how that goes? I see, oh, I have a sense of humor, just so you know. So this is serious, serious, serious talk. Okay, so um, Mr. McLaughlin ends up being a politician. He ended up being the biggest landowner in Hudson County by 1900. His life was a little stressful, so his doctor told him you should probably build yourself a little house in the country to alleviate the stress. He came up with this 22-room, 11-bedroom little house in the country, which sits on Broad Street, built by the architect Charles Fall, who was a brick man. Mostly worked in doing bricks, so he was so happy. I'm sure there's not one brick in the columns at all. <laughs> Um, so and there you have it. So Dennis McLaughlin, we uh, we bought this house in 1982. It was in pretty bad shape. Um, McLaughlin came here. He only lived here for about seven years before he died. Nobody in his family was interested in maintaining the home that we now call home. And um, so it was sold out of the family in 1930. Uh, after that, it changed hands on the average of every seven years. It was a boarding house, a nightclub, a bar, a restaurant a dance studio, a home for the VFW, and a private residence until the Historical Society bought it in 1982 and turned it into our lovely home and museum, which um, we paid $80,000 for it, and it's probably way too much <laughs> because it's constantly under repair. You can imagine what it costs to maintain a building like this. So that's where all of our fundraising efforts usually go. We just recently repaired the columns in the front over the last few years. They were rotting out in the bottom. Not the first time that has happened. The home requires continual maintenance, but that's part of the love of running the Pike County Historical Society. And then, then you get these other things that come into the mix, like, okay, so our prize holding is known as the Lincoln Flag. Has anybody heard of this? Mm -hmm. What is that? Mm -hmm. And you see the way she's, mm -hmm. what does that mean? Mm -hmm. It means that you just heard of it, right? I've heard of that. Do you know anything about it? So it's the, blood, it's, the, it's the flag that was in Ford's Theater the night Lincoln was assassinated, and it's stained with the blood of our 16th president, President Abraham Lincoln. So this is what it looks like. People come to the museum expecting it to be some tiny little flag. No, no, no. It's 102 by 136 inches, I believe. Um, 36 star flag uh, that was draped over the balcony of the presidential box the night Lincoln was shot. Um, so there were two flags of this size as decoration. 
course, you know, the war had just ended and everybody was in a pretty good mood. Uh, Lincoln's married to Lincoln was over the moon to have her husband back, and the war was over, and, you know, she wanted to be the first lady, and, you know, she had a couple issues going on there. And um, so she was just happy to be out with her husband. They made a couple of, you know, they didn't have cell phones back then or anything, so they, they had to send like a telegram or something to try and get a hold of people to invite them to come with them to the theater that night. Well, nobody ever wanted to go anywhere with them because Mary Todd Lincoln wasn't very well liked, to be honest. She was a little temperamental. Um, she was a little under scrutiny from uh, during the war. You know, she was being the, there was problems with the money that she spent to furnish the White House, or she tried to do things and spend too much money while, you know, our troops were going without blankets. So she had some um, issues and uh, she wasn't very well liked. Well, the lucky recipients of the invitation to the theater that night. Um, was Clara Harris and her fiance, Major Henry Rathbone. Clara Harris ran in the same social circles as Mary. So it was okay that she went there, she liked her okay. Um, probably, you know, Lincoln said a lot of great things in his life, but the one thing that the Har Clara Harris was, she said was, hey, you guys want to come to the theater with us uh, on this night tonight? Because it didn't end nicely for any of them, quite honestly. We know what happened to Lincoln, but the story of the rest of them is just as, is just as terrible. So this is the Courier and Ives rendition. It's like those artist renderings that you see in the Weekly World News. So we have John Wilkes Booth, Lincoln, Mary Todd, Clara, and Henry Rathbone. Henry Rathbone tried to, Henry Rathbone actually almost died that night as well. Not too many people know. You see that dagger in Booth's hand. Um, he slashed Henry. Henry tried to stop him after he shot the president um, and unsuccessfully. And then Booth, as you know, you know, jumps over the balcony and lands on the stage, breaks his leg. Yada, yada, yada. So, Henry Rathbone, with this big slash on his left arm, um, is almost leading to death. Nobody's paying attention to him because the president's been shot. The president's been shot. Um, and he wasn't going to make it. So this flag that you don't see depicted in this picture, the one that we just saw back here, was draped over the balcony of the presidential box. Now, this is where the story goes a little awry. Because there's 30 eyewitnesses to the Lincoln assassination, 30 different stories. That's pretty much true. Uh, so the star of the play that night, Laura Keene, the great Laura Keene, who was getting a little long in the tooth to be an actress, actually. She had bought the rights to the play being performed our American cousin and made it her own. She performed it over a thousand times. Um, and this was her big, big night at the Fords. She was performing with the troupe at Fords. So there was a few people that were performing there all the time that became part of her entourage that night to perform the play. And Laura Keene said they all did a very, very good job. So Laura Keene when, was the first person to talk to the crowd after everyone realized that the president had been shot. And she said, keep to your places, everyone. Be calm and keep to your places. Everything will be OK. And then she tried to make her way in one eyewitness account all the way up to the presidential box, which probably wasn't an easy task because of all the people in panic. So a member of the cast named Henry, uh, Thomas Gourlay uh, apparently assisted Miss Miss Keene up to the presidential box and let her in. Now in this version of what, how the Lincoln flag becomes the Lincoln flag, Laura Keene then comforts the president and has his head resting on her lap. And then when she's asked to leave, when they can't decide, well, what are we going to do? You know, we got to get him out of here. We're going to take him across the street to the Peterson house. That's what we do. And so they're like, okay, let's go. Dr. Leo is there. And of course, Clara and Henry and Mary Todd, who now, Clara has Henry's blood all over her, and Mary Todd Lincoln thinks it's Lincoln's blood, so she's not thinking straight, because he only had a little tiny knee, actually right here, and it scabbed over very quickly. The doctor actually had to stick his pinky in it to alleviate some of the pressure. Mm -hmm. So that's one of his head apparently bled upon the flag. Mm -hmm. So they asked him to leave. You know, he, she, her head is on, you know, his head resting on the working his lap. Well, what are we going to do? We can't just drop his head on the floor as the President of the United States would ask. Oh, let's just grab some of this flag, bunch it up. It's right there. And put it under his head as a pillow. What a perfect pillow for the President of the United States, an American flag. That story makes sense, right? Anybody? <laughs> it does. There's another account by Clara Harris, who we know is in the presidential box because she was a guest of the Lincolns. She says, Laura Keene was never in the presidential box. What? She says, oh yeah, Mary Todd Lincoln was a jealous woman. She would never, ever let another woman comfort her husband in that time of need. So who do you believe? What I believe is that somehow or another, this flag got his blood on her. Whether it's that way, 
or another way, or somebody, but, or there's another story that says it was folded in the corner, or flag was folded up in the corner, and they used that as the pillow. So this is what you have, this is the, okay, as you as people who are looking at rocks and stuff, you don't look at a rock and you know exactly what happened to it or where it came from just by looking at it, you have to research it, right? right. Figure it out. Same thing with anything that comes across, you know, in a museum, like what do we do? So what do we know? We know a couple of things. We know that the blood on the flag is a human, it's human blood. So one of the first time, first weeks I was even working in the museum, the flag was not there when I first started working there. It was on loan to a museum in Fort Wayne, Indiana. And then when it came back, some madman came in off the street and started yelling at me and saying that it was bovine blood on that flag. That's not human blood, that's bovine blood. I was like, I had to think, what the hell's a bovine? <laughs> Is that another family name? <laughs> no. I was like, oh, okay, goodbye. You know, thank you for your uh, comments, but we know that it's human blood. We know that it is a contact stain, so that means something had a rest upon it. It's not a splatter or a spill, so that rules out enemy's blood, right? Unless Henry actually wrapped the flag around his arm. It's the correct time frame, correct materials, the dyes, all that. And it's a simple line of possession, which I'm going to tell you about next. And I'm the biggest you know, skeptic that there is in the world, and I didn't even know anything about this flag, because I wasn't supposed to be at the museum at that long. And then when it came back, I had to actually figure out, do I believe this is what it is? And honestly, I do. So there's this lady named Jeannie Gourley Struthers. We should have some kind of monument to her in Milford. I know we don't do monuments anymore, but there should be some acknowledgement of her because if the flag is what it is, it's heralded as one of the most important blood relics in history. You know, it's stained with, with Lincoln's blood. Um, she's the one who brought the flag to Milford. She was an actress in the play. She was in about 21 or 22. Her father was Thomas Gourley the man who brought Jeannie, I mean, uh, Laura Keene up to the uh, presidential box, supposedly, by one account, right? But either way you cut it, if Thomas Gourley is the one who took the flag out of the presidential box because he was there, he then left it to her, he gave it to her to care for while he went to act abroad. She ended up marrying and moved to Milford in 1888. And she, when she moved here, she brought the Lincoln flag with her and she also brought three of her stage costumes. So here we have this lovely woman. I'll tell you why she retired from acting. She saw witness the death of the president, number one. She was only 21 or two. By the time she retired, she was 23. Yeah. Um, another thing, terrible thing that happened when she was a child, she was part of a child acting troupe called the Marsh Troop, right? And they were performing, I think in Alabama. And what happened was one of the stars of the play, little Mary Marsh, was, uh, it was the Nyack Queen, and she had on this fairy dress. And she went to run across the stage and her dress caught on fire because of the candles. And she watched Mary Marsh burn to death. Fast forward, so what happened was Mary Marsh, all these people tried to jump on her and put the fire out. They were burned as well. She's in the wings watching this. And then she's only a child, I think she was 11. 10 years later, she witnesses the president being shot. So both of them died the next morning after an accident in the theater. So she's like, I'm done. Okay, I, you know. And if that wasn't enough, the very next day, Jeannie Gourlay was supposed to star in her own production called of The Octa Room, where she was supposed to be the star in the play. It was her big break. Nothing was ever performed at Ford's Theater after that. So she didn't even get to perform in The Octa Room. The police came in and they thought all the actors were part of a conspiracy to, to assassinate Lincoln. They asked them all to stay in town, don't leave town. And, uh, but Laura Keene didn't think that was meant for her, so she merrily went on her way and um, was arrested in Harrisburg on the train and brought back to Milford, I mean to uh, D.C., not Milford, no, she was <laughs> brought back to Washington, D.C., um, you know, where she was, you know, questioned and uh, with everyone else. So Jeannie definitely took the flag. Her father took it from the theater that night, whether he took it that day or put it someplace and took it out of the theater, I'm convinced that Thomas Gourley took it. At some point, he gave it to Jeannie to, for safekeeping. She then in turn moves to Milford. So not only, so this is the story of the wicked flag, so the provenance is good on it as well. It's very short. It went from Washington, D.C. to Milton. Um, whether people choose to believe that or not, I do not know. There are skeptics out there that say that, you know, this flag is, there's stories that have been created that you would not believe. There's one man who actually used to be on the board of the Pike County Historical Society before my time, who still has a Civil War blog where he claims, you know, the wicked flag is a, is a fake. And the stories that he concocts are, are pretty interesting. I mean, I read them, but, I don't believe them. So out of this, we have the Lincoln flag, right? We're okay with that being what it is. But what also happened is the way people create stories just to make things more interesting than they really are. 
So she had these uh, stage costumes. Well, this one was on display forever at the museum. And uh, they told me to interpret it by telling people it was the gown that was never worn for the song that was never sung. I mean, that's pretty dramatic. <laughs> I'm like, well, what is that? I own that gown. <laughs> so I wear it. Just last night. Um, so I'm like, I'm looking at it, and I'm, I'm telling that story over the first couple of years, and I'm working there, and I'm like, and this is the gown that was never worn for the song that was never sung. And, you know how this was the gown that Jeannie Barley was supposed to wear when there's supposed to be a big tribute to the president that night at the theater. So as time goes on, there's two other gowns as well. As time goes on, you know, the gowns are getting a little raggedy. So we send them off to Shippensburg University Fashion Institute um, so they could take a look at them, see what we could do to conserve them, to do a little to shore them up, you know. Um, and they open up the boxes, three boxes. Then she opens up the first box, and it's this gown. So they did all these pictures. Well, they determined this gown wasn't even made until after 1865. <laughs> So first of all, I don't know where they got that information from at the historical society, or like it's like a telephone game, you know. Like by the time it gets, because think about it, they got these things donated to them in 1954 by the son of Jeannie Borlet. By the time we opened the columns, the museum in 1982, you know, maybe the story got switched around a little bit, or maybe they just wanted to make it so interesting so that people just couldn't, you know, couldn't believe it. Well, I didn't believe it. So when I found out that it actually wasn't that, I was like, well, what about the other gowns? Maybe the story is just about another dress. So what do we know? There are three stage costumes. The gown that was never worn for the song that was never sung. Shippensburg Institute of Fashion says no way. <laughs> it was not worn because it wasn't even made. And then what happens? The actual stage costume appears because that was in the other box. Mm. So the bodice is actually what Jean Gourley wore on stage that night is Mary Meredith, the poor milkmaid in the production of Our American Cousin. Um, we're still trying to raise funds to get the, the, uh, the skirt redone because it's the same brick of rack and it's very intricate and um, she was a little tiny, tiny little thing, huh? So there you go, out of a catastrophe of like, oh my God, we've been lying about the gown that was never worn for the song that was never sung. Let's just have somebody tell us really what we have here and then what happens is we find the actual stage costume that she wore. So that's a good ending for me. That's fine. I can deal with that. So are there any questions at all about the Lincoln flag? Because <coughs> the museum is open tomorrow. If anybody, I don't think you have time. They have a pretty full schedule. So. Has the blood ever been DNA tested? No. There has been people that have asked to do that. There is no, there's nothing to compare it to. So what we have is the other blood relics, as they call them, which are the sheets from the Peterson House, which are at the, they're at the Chicago Historical Society. Um, and they have no testing policy. Then there's a bullet fragment or a bone fragment in Silver Springs, Maryland at the Medical Museum that is of Lincoln's skull. They have no testing policy. There are no living relatives left of Lincoln. The last of the line died in 1982. Although someone did call me not too long ago and told me I could buy Lincoln's hair on eBay. <laughs> <laughs> so there's always that. But, so basically the problem with that is there's nothing to compare it to that would, you know, yes ma'am. So when I heard the story of the flag originally, there was also a parallel story of a, of a handkerchief, which also has the Right, there are several what they call blood relics. The handkerchief, I'm not sure of the provenance of that or where it ended up. I think it's at Ford's Theater Museum. Is that the, we don't have it and we never did. Um, but it might be at Forest Theater. The flag went back to Forest Theater for a blood relic exhibit at the anniversary of his death, and there was a cuff, a, a cuff from a shirt that had blood on it. Um, i trying to think what else. The sheets from the Peterson house, I believe they were loaned to them. A couple of other things. Um, but the problem is, you know, we, the, 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 what's the provenance of that handkerchief, right? And also Laura Keene's dress, what happened to that? It was, she cut that up into pieces and gave it away. Mm. So there was a Dr. Sotos who did a documentary, which everybody wants, anybody wants to watch it. It's, it's about how he tried to prove that Lincoln had Marfan syndrome, um, which is a blood disease, right? So he said that his facial features, his elongated ears, uh, his long face and some other things, uh, something with his eyes, lead people to, led him to believe that he might have had Marfan syndrome. So he approached us and he wanted a um, he wanted to take a piece of the Lincoln flag and do try to get DNA. My board ultimately turned him down, but he did find someone who claimed they had a piece of that 
gown that's out there that you know Laura Keen cut up and gave away in pieces. And when you watch the documentary, you see what a hard time they really had trying to find a viable sample of DNA because it's so old. And other than that, they had to send it to, I believe it was someplace in Switzerland, that finally got, got some kind of read on it. And when it didn't match, or it didn't show that he had, it didn't show the Mark Van syndrome gene in it or whatever in the blood, um, they're like, well, then obviously that's a fake artifact. So we were, would run the risk of, you know, if it didn't match or we couldn't, and then he would, you know, declare the Lincoln flag fake, and then here would come that whole controversy that I experienced all over again. Um, and certainly I don't, I don't want that. Um, you know, it's just kind of common sense, and it's a simple story. And, you know, Jeannie Worley lived a quiet life after she came here with the flag. She never talked about it publicly, only once when she was older. Um, you know, she didn't try to make any money. It's, it's so hard to believe that this is just like a memento, something that somebody just kept. You know, in today's age, people are always think, you know, we don't get very many donations to the museum anymore because anytime somebody's grandmother died, they go up in the attic and they sell all our stuff. You know, or put it on eBay, you know. So museums, you know, are really, we're not in trouble, but you know, sometimes you don't want half of the things that people bring to you anyway, and you have a hard time saying no, like the dirty bird cage that the lady brought to me a couple months ago. <laughs> and I got, she goes, it's an antique bird cage. I'm like, that's cool. You love this. She didn't even clean it out, you know, and here she brings the bird cage. I was like, yeah, no thanks. So it's an interesting job. I was like, where's the birds? She said, in my freezer. <laughs> so I knew she was like, I'm not kidding. The people that have come to that place in my ears are amazing, it's amazing the story. I would get to a few more of them, but um, what is it that you wanted me to talk about with the Tom Quick Monument? I know that I said I would touch upon that. Is there something in particular well, that... Just that, so our, our focus this whole weekend is on these uh, anomalous stone landscapes that we presuppose are created by indigenous people. So it's the Indian connection, it's the Native American connection. I know Tom Quick was a reported famous Indian killer, yeah. and we were all about the stuff that Indians did, pre Tom Quick and all European. Okay, well, we know that the original settlers in this part of, you know, here in, in Pike County in particular, we believe the Wolf Man, I think the Lenape Indians. Um, they were a peaceful tribe. Um, so then here come the Dutch settlers. I'll, I'll make it brief. We know the story, you know, land grabs, land grabs. Uh, the walking purchase didn't help, um, where, you know, William, uh, William Penn's sons found some document that was ages old and, and presented it to, to the chief of the Lenape at the time. I think, well, I forget his name. I'm not going to go there with trying to do that, pronouncing them. But so they said, well, okay, we have to honor it. So what happens is, you know, there's the amount of land that a man could walk in, you know, uh, a day and a half. And so they hire a runner and they get like triple the amount of land that they should have got once you draw the parallel. So they got land all the way to the Lac to the Waxen River up by Glenier, Pennsylvania, uh, from you know where it started. But before that, you know, with Tom Quick, he was just uh, it just really the story of Tom Quick is just simpler than that. It's just like this Dutch settler, Tom Quick and his son, Tom Quick Jr. You know, they're out doing their business one day. It, it's at a time when you know there's wars going on and, and people are fighting over land, and there's it's not a very good time in just the, the relations between the settlers and the Indians. And whether they fired upon Tom Quick and they shot him, senior, and then you know the son and his brother-in-law ran to get away. But they couldn't save the father, so they kept going across the river. And they turned around to see what you know what happened, and they, they apparently witnessed Tom Quick, wit, junior, witness his father being scalped by the Indians. So we vowed to leave a life of vengeance uh, from that day on, and then it becomes either folklore because you know there's like so many stories oh well, they killed 99 indians and on his deathbed asked for the, the scalp of one more to make an even hundred um you know there's modern day articles written about tom quick jr saying that he's a you know a modern maniac a psychopath you know eventual but i mean these were the times i i think you know it, it was kind of both sides both sides were doing terrible things to one another at that time like any other war um so they decided years later why I do not know to erect this monument to, to Tom Quick Sr. as the first Dutch settler in Milford, which is fine. Settler's monument isn't too far fetched. But then, you know, the writing on it, I mean, Gone with the Wind was shorter. Because you look, you know, at one side, 
And it goes on and on about, you know, how Tom Quick Sr., the first Dutch diver made about Upper Duke. And then the next, you know, there's four songs to that on the list. Which was made of the Sake Sing. Does that mean anything? That's what I know it's made of. I'm from the Sake, that's why I like to say that. The Sake New Jersey. Anyway, so then the second side is, it goes on to say how Tom Quick Jr. witnessed the death of his father at the hand of the savages. So the terminology, modern day, became a problem. So in the early 1980s, somebody came through town. It was placed, I don't know, Marie, where did, this is supposedly Sarah Street, but it's not what it looks like today, obviously, because we're talking the seven. Right behind the gas station. Yeah, I, yeah, but you know, now it's on like a little island. Well, it's not there anymore. So in the, anyway, this, I guess, is what it looked like originally. Uh, I don't know. I've never seen that gate. I would love to have some, you know, see where all that stuff ended up. But the monument still exists. But beyond that, when they dedicated the monument, in, I think it was 1899, no, no, 1799 or something, I forget the date, whatever. So they dedicate this monument, and they dig up Tom Quick's bones, which are in a cemetery here in Mad Morris, actually not far from here, Rose, Rose Town, right, the road that goes behind here. And they put it in like, I don't know, a mayonnaise jar, and they stick it under the thing, and they, now it becomes a gravesite as well. So this is not only, you know, a monument to the, to, uh, the first white, Settler, uh, Indian killer, or you know, Native American killer, and now his bones are under there, so it's a great size as well. So, oh, that's crazy. So somebody doesn't like it, so they put a, a sledgehammer through part of the off, the, the front part where we're talking about Tom Quick Jr. and the savages, um, and then they took it down and they put it in hiding. And if I told you where it was, I'd have to kill you. <laughs> and then years and years went by. Um, when I first started my job, it was 22, 22 years ago, around 20 years ago, another man in town and myself tried to have it put back up, and we came to pretty close to getting it happen. We put up a little disclaimer. Um, we had some kind of peaceable ceremonies. Uh, Bill Kiger and I tried to do this. Uh, we had meetings in the Tom Quick Inn. There's another story. They know the Tom Quick Inn had 99, still has 99 little Indian skulls around the bar. There was a hatchet hanging over the, yeah. This was in the 1950s, the waitresses dressed like squaws. Oh. And um, I mean, everybody's like, oh. <laughs> but this is what happened. Nobody cared back then. Everybody cares too much now. And, and the, the bathrooms were like bucks and squaws and, you know, whatever. It was, it was it's hokum. It's just, it's just marketing. It's nothing different than what people, I don't think people are marketing things today. I, I think it's just taking advantage of the, of the, I don't know. I was just looking through a camp catalog from Sagamore Camp, 1933, where there's a guy dressed as an Indian chief and it says, and we have real Indian folklore here. A real red skin from Oklahoma is on our campgrounds all the time. So people take offense to this today. But trust me, in 1933, people, that was a plus. We're like, we're sending our kid to camp because they have a real red skin there. You know what I mean? It's not funny. But it's the truth. And it's history. And we can't look at something that's that old and that archaic. And the mindset is archaic. And put it in today's time and say that's wrong. Sure it's wrong. We all know it's wrong by today's standards. I'm not saying that it was good at any time. But we didn't know any better. I mean it, it should be a testament to how far we've come that so many people get upset by, by these things. Not like get offended and try and close the museum because guess who has the Tom Quick monument now? <laughs> but we also didn't just say, oh give us that monument, we want the monument of the Indian killer, you know. We went through a lot of trouble and got permission from the three federally recognized Wenape tribes to put it in there. Why? Because they agree it's part of the history. It's part of the story. And we let them do the interpretation and create the panel boards. Yes? And where are the bones? They're still in that mayonnaise jar on uh, Sarah Street, where there's like, a, like an island, and they plant flowers, and they plant flowers over it. And there's some kind of little trap door and so I'm guessing that the bones are still in that jar because it's still, you know, in the little disclaimer plaque that we put up when we tried to get the monument put back up for the right reasons, not for any wrong reasons. But um, it says, you know, this is, this still remains a gravesite, respected as such. I mean, it might not be the gravesite of the most loved man in the world, but if anybody would respect it, it would be the Lenape Indians because they were very respectful of things like that. So I don't believe for a minute that 
the Lenape Indians had anything to do with the desecration of the monument. Yes? Is that on display in the museum now? Yep. Okay. That's another thing. So we have the monument. It almost cracked our front porch in half trying to get it in there because it weighs like, you know, 7,000 pounds. I don't know how much it's made. It's hollow, but it's made of the sake zinc, which is, a, it's, you know, it's, it's pretty heavy and it's pretty substantial. It's about seven and a half feet tall. People come in now, they go, oh, is that the Tom Quick monument? They go, oh, it's a rep look up. Okay. You didn't carry it in here. You must have <laughs> I wish it was a rep look up. Then my floor wouldn't be sagging. <laughs> so this is the kind of things that just people just drive me nuts. That's what they said. So I don't know about my time is what what else? Any other questions about the Tom Quick? You're good on time. Good on time. Okay, I'll tell you a few little stories. Sorry. Yes? Is it Tom Quick Senior or Junior whose bones? Tom Quick Jr. Junior. Junior. Okay. Yeah, because they said after he, he died, um, in the Rosencrantz house right here in Madame Morris. Mm -hmm. And um then there's another whole story that says, you know, they buried him, and then the Indians went and uh, dug up his grave, and he died of smallpox, so they were all infected in smallpox, and he killed even more Indians in death. <laughs> right? That's some guy. He was on it. So Tom Quick, you know, it's mostly folklore, but it, you know, it is a story. It's a sign of the times. This is what was going on back then. You know, there was Indians that were running families on the other side of the river, killed women and children. I mean, these stories, you know, we know this happens. And the displacement of Indians is, is a problem. It's, it's happening across the United States, as everybody knows. So it's not a new story. It's an old story. It's a sad story. But it's still part of history. We can do everything we can to make it better, and that's what we're, that's the only thing we can try to do. So. Do you have time to talk about, oh, <laughs> this guy? No, I was going to say that um, that crazy uh, priest. Oh, Father Francis Crowd. Yeah. He's not included in this presentation. Okay, yeah. No, dude funder. funder. Yeah, that's, that's a touchy situation because of you know, his relations with the nuns. But we're not going to talk about that. <laughs> <laughs> See, history is funny. <laughs> so this is another... Is it a legend? Is it true about this guy or not? This is Chief Thundercloud. Um, he is a famous Indian model. He modeled for John Singer Sargent, and he modeled for uh, Frederick Remington, and he modeled for uh, for their great, you know, their depictions of the Great West, um, and uh, Francis Millet. So, in the case of Francis Millet, we have a portrait, which is a study, I guess you would call it, Maria. No, it's not. It was something that he did with him in his studio that was going to go on to be a bigger thing. Yeah, right. So. So we know it's thundercloud, but what he was doing the study, I mean, you know, Francis Mill, he's, he's pretty good. Um, so this is a, a mural that's hanging in the state house in Minnesota. It's called the Treaty of the Traverse to Sioux, um, where it depicts everybody so happy, so happy with this treaty. Yeah, no, because here's another instance where um, this is why they're trying to take the, this down from, from the state house in Minnesota, because it depicts, you know, a happy, transaction where actually these people, the white guys, are you know, ripping off the unions once again. Um, so it went down in history as a terrible, terrible deal, yet another. And so why is it depicted in this way? Well, maybe because Francis Millet was the one who did the mural. Um, there was an original picture of it that they asked him to reproduce. So when he was reproducing it, he used Thundercloud as a model for that Indian right in the forefront. I can't move from here. Is, th is Thundercloud a comfort guy? Yeah. So he was, he was from Canada. You can see that just that in the museum by Francis Millet, just that part of that. There's David. a laser pointer there somewhere. Looks like a pig. I'm not going there. I don't even know. <laughs> <laughs> I'm lucky I got this far today. Um, okay, so Thundercloud was a uh, uh, Blackfoot Indian from Canada. Um, you know, there's a lot of stories about him. A lot of people say, oh, he was the model for the $5 gold piece. Well, I had a man go way out of his way to prove that wasn't true. He was in the museum every day calling me. You know, we wrote a book about coins, and he's like, it is not Thundercloud. I'm like, okay. It's okay. It doesn't have to be Thundercloud. I wasn't really, you know, I wasn't you know, counting on it, but whatever. It's just something that somebody said. You know, it's like the gown that was never worn for the song that was never sung. <laughs> what do we do know about him? Yes, his name was Dominique LaPont. He was Blackfoot with French roots from Canada. 
He did take on the name Chief Thundercloud. He was a model. He posed for the, the big club in New York where all the artists studied. And he did that. And you know, he did a lot of stuff. He was a Native American model. Okay, in 1900. That's kind of a cool thing to be. Late 1800s, 1900. No, he was not in Buffalo Bill's Wild West show. Because people were like, oh yeah, he was that Indian in that role. I was like, no, he wasn't. He was not in Buffalo. He was from, he spent some time in Buffalo. That doesn't mean, there's no proof of him being in that. And no, he's not the five dollars, not the model for the five dollar gold piece. So again, these are things we're just trying to, you know, he's buried in, in Pike County. He's buried in a cemetery in, in Damon's Ferry. And people go and they put little gifts on his grave and all this and that. So that's, you know, it's a nice part of Pike County's history. Everything that people say about it doesn't have to be the truth, but we're trying to tell people the absolute truth of the museum, not, you know, things that are made up. And we don't get mad if we find out that something isn't what we said it was, because that's what we're here to do. I'm here to tell you, you know, try to be, you know, tell you things with integrity and not make up crazy stories. Like this next story, this is the best one. <laughs> Okay, you can't really see it. I don't have a picture of it. But you see that like secretary in the left-hand corner, like the desk kind of thing next to that's the Salt Hill House flag. It's not the one you can But you see that like desk thing with the books in it. Okay, that's known as the Galat Secretary. It was given to us by the Galat family. Now it's G U I L L O T. They're from Bushkill, and they gave us that in some journals that exist in that desk secretary thing. And one day I came into work, and there's a volunteer that's working very imaginative volunteer that's working. And now mind the spelling, but G-I-L-L-O-T. Gio, maybe? Galop? That's how the family chooses to pronounce their name. She's telling people, oh, this is a secretary that belonged to the man who invented the guillotine. <laughs> I'm not kidding. I'm like, where do you get this stuff? She goes, well, his name's, you know, spelled the same. I'm like, well, obviously, that it must mean that he invented that. That's true. The electric chair. Did you know that the museum had an electric chair? It's not. It's a, it's a Lee Curtis Perm machine. 1930. A reporter or one of those uh, bloggers came through the museum and he's like, oh, I'm going to write an article, you know, I'm traveling through Milford. I was like, great. Go upstairs, take some, go upstairs, take some pictures. I'm like, sure. I see the article, of course, on Facebook or you know, social media, thank God. Um, he's like, oh, the museum even has an electric chair. I wonder who, how many people were killed in that thing. I'm like, good, I don't know, because we don't have one. For the next three weeks, people are coming in, where's the electric chair? Where's the electric chair? So, it's crazy. But anyway, any other questions? Because that's really all I really want to talk about. <laughs> this is us. We're the home of the Lincoln flag, believe it or not. And um, our hours are Wednesday and Saturday from 1 to 4, Sunday from 11 to 2. And any other questions that we have to answer? No? When yes? You, when you said Dutch settlers with the Quick score, did you mean Dutch or German? Dutch. Tom Quick was Dutch. And we had a big influx of uh, French Huguenots in Milford, and the original settlers, the Quicks were Dutch. Quick and all, Quick, a lot of Dutch families. Of New Jersey and here. That's it. Thank you very much.